the Museum of Contemporary, uh, was then the Museum of Contemporary Crafts. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, of ecclesiastical art and had some vestments that were embroidered. And I loved those and, and uh, thought, well, I could do that. Uh, so um, I, I did finally uh, start to do some stitched work and I always liked putting things together. I also, uh, around that time, in the early 60s, I saw uh, the, the first Rauschenberg uh, retrospective in New York. And I was just blown away by, uh, by all the combine pieces. And so I then started to do some pieces in cloth. And finally, um, at, at first they were just uh, applique and stitched. And then I discovered clothing after seeing that show, I began to use actual uh, clothing objects. And, and so finally, uh, I was doing those through the 60s and I made the opera coat in 1968. And it was uh, a coat that was given to me by a student. I was teaching all this time and living in Miami at that point. And, uh, and so uh, that's how the opera coat came into being. And then uh, was uh, collected by Paul Smith, and I forget who else came down to Miami, and um, and was it was it Lee Nordness? Who came it, to yes, it probably was Lee Nordness. Yes. Mm -hmm. And did you actually make it to Objects USA? I think you might have told me that you never saw the show. Is that I right? never saw the show. <laughs> I was living in Miami and I didn't see it. Uh, of course, I have the book and, uh, and I know it went around the world, but I did not see it. And you, you were on the cover of uh, what was then Craft Horizons as well, now American Craft Magazine. So it did, the work went around the, the world, not just in the show, but also in terms of images. Um, I, I'd love to hear you say a little bit more about what you saw in Rauschenberg, um, which is such an interesting connection. You saw that retrospective, I guess, at the Jewish Museum, is that right? At some point. Uh, yes, I did see it at the Jewish Museum. And, uh, you know, when I went to art school, um, abstract expressionism was the cutting edge art. And I really uh, became interested in that. I had been totally naive before that, didn't really know anything about contemporary art, but uh, I loved the idea of putting things together, finding things. I've always liked to work from something, uh, whether it's an object or a picture, uh, but I, I need to have something uh, in order to go forward. So um, when I saw how he took these objects and combined them, uh, well, I, I was very excited by that and it was a really big influence on me. Mm. But you know, it's interesting that you mentioned abstract expressionism because now looking at Knapsack um, from 1971, there's also something very painterly and indeed expressive in the work, the way that you're using the linear materials of yarn, cord, these techniques of wrapping, it all often seems like the fiber material is exploding outwards from the form in a way that I would really associate actually with expressionist aesthetics. And I wonder if you see that connection as well. I do. I think uh, even now, uh, if you look closely at the stitch patterns uh, mm -hmm. that I'm making, uh, they're abstract. And uh, I mean, they, they go together and ultimately form uh, a figure, but, uh, but as I'm working on them, I'm really looking at them because it's slow. It's, it's, I always thought of it as the slowest way in the world to make a drawing. And mm -hmm. uh, it's all lines. And I'm just working with those lines in an abstract way. Hmm. We're, we're looking now at Flight Suit, Marilyn, um, which has a really great, uh, one of the great passages of this 
vociferous, almost ferocious kind of stitching that you're talking about. Um, so it's a great example. And it also, to me, it really speaks of the period with this kind of intense color sensibility that you were working with. But I actually wanted to ask you about the source of some of these military um, pieces of clothing that you were working with. Of course, this is during the Vietnam War. So it seems like a very non-innocent choice to be using these kind of army and air force fatigues, this kind of material. Can you say a little bit about that? Well, when I, when I was working with pieces of clothing, uh, and of course it was uh, during the Vietnam War, but these pieces of clothing were from World War II, mm. which I lived through and remembered. Uh, I was in middle school then, and all of my cousins, you know, and some of my uncles went into the service. And I remember that very well. Uh, but now that was over. And somehow I just, I liked the way these military uniforms looked. <laughs> and uh, I think it was almost a visual thing that I was uh, going through then. Uh, mm. I think there was uh, a, a uh, subconscious statement about war, but mostly I was looking at these as objects mm -hmm. and, um, and celebrating that they were not, they were from World War II and World War II was over and we could use these in other ways. So yeah. they were kind of a celebration of these previous uniforms. Hmm, it's so interesting. So it's not as, as um, simplistic as just an anti-war statement. Although I, I also would say it is very grounded in its moment. I, I was just thinking of something that Leo Steinberg said about Rauschenberg's work. He, he said that it had a flatbed aesthetic as in a flatbed truck. So like anything you put on it would just sort of stick there or sit there. and. <laughs> I, I feel like um, Flight Suit in particular, but I think all of these works in, in a way, they really speak of this moment when the counterculture was colliding with official America's sense of itself. And it feels like you managed to capture so much of what was happening in the country 50 years ago in, in works like this. Um, oh, that's so interesting because I, I don't know if I thought of it that way, but... Uh... <laughs> I, I certainly uh, uh, think that probably was there somewhere in my thinking. You were a sensitive register. That's the... <laughs> yes, that's the something like that. Yeah. Um, it might um, make sense at this juncture just to introduce the character of Bill Wyman, who, of course, is very important to you in many ways. Um, so we have these two works, one of which has, on the right is Bill's uh, ceramic work, and then on the left, um, Bill's bag, which I assume is made from a, uh, an object that you got from him. Can you talk a little bit about your relationship with him? Yes. Uh, in uh, 1971, I went to Haystack School for Crafts uh, for the first time, and I was a visiting artist there for four weeks. I, I knew Bill Wyman. Uh, just a little. He had gone to Mass College of Art uh, and graduated two years ahead of me. And um, uh, so uh, a, a mutual friend of ours uh, uh, arranged for me to drive up there with him. And that was, uh, that was like a six hour drive. And that was the beginning <laughs> of almost a decade of uh, being uh, together. Moment of his um, ceramic work. Um, Marilyn, are you back by any chance? If not, Beth, I'm gonna start asking you about Marilyn. Oh, sure. <laughs> well, and just a note too, that that piece by William Wyman is in our collection. Um, Oh, this is Which we're very floor. thrilled. Yes, that's part okay. of. We have several works of his in the collection. That that's one of them. So it's um, was really a terrific moment for us to be able to bring these two pieces together. Um, mm -hmm. Bill's bag, of course, on the left that has some of the ceramic elements that Bill had sent to Maryland to include in in the work itself. 
Oh, I see. So it's the ceramic yeah. elements that are associated with the yeah. bag itself. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So the the bag that says Quincy Bay Marina, that was just a found object that Marilyn had used, and he had sent her um, some fragments of ceramic work. Got it. Okay. That piece. Yeah. Um, if you don't mind, I'm just going to proceed along until sure. we get Marilyn back. Um, so one interesting thing to say about Marilyn's uh, career is that she really had to set aside her studio practice um, for quite a while, not never entirely. She was really focusing on teaching when she came back up to Boston. And so um, there's, uh, a, in a sense, a kind of hiatus. And then she re-enters her studio practice in the 80s, 90s, almost as a different artist in some ways, although you can see a lot of continuity. And this piece, Veiled Married, is, is sort of from that moment of transition. So can you just say a little bit about that from your perspective, Beth? Because I know as a curator, that must have been interesting. It's almost like having a group show with one artist in a way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And to me, this, this piece really was kind of this transition piece between um, her earlier works in which she included these found elements and started to bring in the ancient sculptural forms that, of course, um, informed such a larger part of her practice before. Um, also, it's this is not a great image, so it's tough to see, but there's also a map um, included in this work. So, you know, as we were going through this presentation earlier, Glenn, you said, oh, this, this you know, this image isn't, isn't, the, isn't the best. And I said, I agree, but I felt like it was so important to have in the show and in this presentation because it really is um, a wonderful conflation of these different um, series that she had and really kind of shows a spark, the spark of them and, and kind of radiates out in different directions into the past and into the future of what she was about to create. So um, I think it's yeah. a really beautiful amalgamation. Absolutely. And in fact, um, probably her least well-known body of work is what she was managing to do while she was principally teaching. Um, and that had a lot to do with travel that she was doing with Bill. And, and often there was a, almost like a kind of meta-touristic consideration in that right. work where she was using kind of stock. Can images. you hear me now? Oh, hi. I, 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 I'm back on the... <laughs> There she I'm is. Back on on uh, the other telephone now, and I think that Great. Jill managed to get my voice in there again. Super. Anyway, so we, I like listening to you. <laughs> okay, I'm glad you could hear hear it. We're 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 giving the audience a variety show here, so <laughs> <laughs> every version of a of a talk about and with Marilyn um, Pappas, which is great. So we we've, we've gotten um we've gotten up to the uh, what I. I'm inclined to call your mature work, Marilyn, uh, which is this very sensitive sculptural use of stitching to create um, works that engage deeply with classicism and also, of course, with the figure. Um, so can you say a little bit, um, we, we just were talking about the kind of your return to full-time studio practice when teaching start, stopped being such a burden for you, but can you say a little bit more about that moment and what, what was happening for you creatively at the time? Uh, yes, uh, I was into another whole life because, as you know, Bill Wyman died in 1980. Mm -hmm. And in 1985, I met my late husband with whom I, Bill Harvey, who, another Bill, who I was with for 30 years. And, and he loved to travel to Mediterranean countries. And, and I was teaching, but we would go to... Uh, uh, Italy, France, Greece, uh, every moment that we could and spend time there. And uh, so I became very interested in uh, uh, classical sculpture and classical architecture. And ultimately it sort of winnowed itself down to uh, uh, the female figures that the uh, Greek, ancient Greek and Romans uh, uh, showed. And I saw them as such a dichotomy because we look at them in their bleached out white state and their missing arms and heads. And we look at them and say, oh, isn't that beautiful? And uh, something about that got to me. And I started to think as I got closer to uh, retirement that I really wanted to go back to working with fabric. Actually, I had taken my students to New York uh, 
from time to time. And at one point, the opera coat was hanging over the ticket desk at the museum. And uh, I just really wanted to uh, do some new fabric work. Uh, and it took me about three years to figure out exactly what to do. I had been doing collages all this time. And uh, so, so that's actually how I became interested in, in these ancient figures. Mm. And I suppose museums must have been important to you as well. So seeing, um, you know, I think of, I'm in London right now, so I think of the Elgin Marbles. Oh, absolutely, uh, right. And I sat and the... drew uh, uh, in, in, uh, in that museum, yeah. Yeah, and drawing is such a, um, you said earlier that, that um, actually here's one of these um, interesting collages that deals with mapping, which is something that we've, we've talked about. But th this, um, this idea of drawing with thread and this idea of a slow way of making a drawing, one thing I'm interested to ask you about is what that's like for you as you sort of sit with the image because you're spending such a long time with it. And so the image is accumulating as it were. And what happens for you over that length of time that you're spending with the object, with the image? Well, a lot of things happen. <laughs> For one thing, it's uh, it's very meditative, mm. uh, but also uh, it takes so long that I take it from my studio to my living space, and I work on it uh, in many different situations. Mm. And I, I do want to say that I have the most wonderful part-time assistant. Liz Newman, who has been with me for over 20 years, and she also graduated from Mass College of Art in, in the fiber program, but after I retired, and um, she, she does some of the stitching for me now, and sometimes it's social, and we sit and stitch together. So I have all kinds of experiences uh, when I'm sewing, and uh, I just work in my lap, but I keep putting them up on the wall to look at. And one uh, thing about fabric and thread is that it's very forgiving. I mean, you can just rip it out if you don't like what you're doing. So I, all kinds of experiences, I think. Mm, absolutely. It's, um, it's also interesting that the uh you talked about earlier the thread has a kind of expressive line to it and th this is a very interesting image to me because it sort of shows your whole uh world <laughs> your sort of your, your head space but um one thing that people will have noticed is that after a period of working principally in white blacks and grays you started to use color again so here we have the gods and color show catalog and the the, where, the awareness i think most people do now know this but um for a lot of us, it was a surprise to find out that these ancient sculptures were actually very brightly polychrome. They weren't just white. Um, and uh, there's been a lot of discussion about that. But that was also a very important thing for your work, wasn't it? To not just be drawing expressively, but be drawing in color. Yes, I, I actually missed color uh, mm -hmm. after several years of, of working in the monochromatic tones. And when I saw that show, which, which now, by the way, is at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Bad, but yeah. it, yes, it, it was at Harvard several years ago. And I just, uh, I had seen the uh, polychrome um, sculptures in Greece. Uh, and so I, I knew they were very garish. I knew they were painted, but I never thought much about them until I saw that show and all of a sudden I really wanted to use color in my work again. And it took me a couple of years before I figured out what to do. I didn't want to just uh, 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 make them the way they were then. So finally I decided, well, I could just play with color. Mm. And uh, I am using some of the colors that they use, but I'm just, uh, working with 
abstract patterns again uh, and enjoying the use of color. And uh, I do try to use them in a way that enhances the figure. Um, but I don't really try to uh, make them the way they were, though I have done some, a few things with patterns that they actually use, but mostly not. It's very interesting that um, the history of drapery comes in here as well, because drapery, you could say, is the kind of abstraction before abstraction. You know, if you look at a 16th century Renaissance painting, the drapery is quite abstract. It sort of describes what fabric does, but it's also very imaginative. And I feel like you're really tapping into that tradition as well, which, of course, goes right back to the uh, uh, ancient world, but via the history of painting, which does seem to be very present in these works as well. And I've always loved the way uh, Renaissance painters uh, painted drapery. So I've always been interested in drapery and, uh, and that kind of patterning. Like I love looking out of an airplane window at the landscape and sometimes that looks like drapery too. So that kind of patterning is very appealing to me. Yeah, the topology of that, right? Yeah. Um, Beth had mentioned earlier this series, Nevertheless, She Persisted, which is an important body of work that you've been developing over the past few years, very beautifully featured in the show. Um, we were just talking about the kind of return of the repressed of color in <laughs> ancient sculpture, but there's also a different kind of emergence here, which I anyway receive as a statement of feminism, which has been implicit in your practice, arguably right since the beginning, but here it seems to come forward a little bit more explicitly. Could you talk a little bit about that, your relationship to feminism and your idea of yourself as a woman artist as well as an artist, period? Well, you know, I, I was an artist. Uh, I mean, I've been an artist now for 60 years. And so, and I've also been a teacher and a wife and a mother and a single mother. And so I, I've been very conscious of uh, all of the different roles that women are called on to play. And I've played them myself uh, for a very long time. So uh, when feminism in the 60s and 70s was going on, well, I, I, I thought that was wonderful because when I started to uh, lead a life of multiple roles, there weren't too many women doing that. So the more women who did it, I thought was great. Uh, and with this work, uh, I'm thinking about uh, this particular series, uh, Nevertheless, She Persisted. I'm thinking about endurance and also what happens over time because uh, that's been one of my interests in working with the uh, ancient sculptures. Uh, they change as we all change. And uh, they, the ancient sculptures are broken and battered. And uh, yet as they change, uh, they also create a new kind of beauty and strength and uh, and so in, in this series, uh, I'm trying to deal with uh, what happens over time. And of course, I'm now in my 90s, so I'm thinking about aging. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I'm very grateful that I, I'm still working. So it's a little bit about, um, about all of that, mm -hmm. endurance, aging hmm. yeah it's hard not to read the title as being autobiographical <laughs> because if there's one thing you've done it's certainly to persist um but I, i'm fascinated to hear from you marilyn what it's like to actually have a retrospective at this point for you i mean a lot of artists don't get retrospectives i guess so they never have this amazing opportunity to see the trajectory of their career laid out like this for them and I'm wondering how it feels for you, particularly because there are these discrete chapters in, in your career and how it, what you're seeing that new, um, what you're seeing differently. Well, I've loved 
working with Beth and with everyone at the Fuller. They've all been just wonderful to me. And I love the way uh, they hung the show. Uh, and uh, I loved working with them. Uh, it's, it's been really an interesting experience to see the early work along with uh, the later work. Uh, uh, I have seen the opera code in exhibitions uh, over time, but I never was able to get up so close to it as when it was sent to the museum and, and the show is getting installed. Mm -hmm. So uh, taking a close look at these uh, early works and then seeing how they somehow morphed into the next work that I did and then the next work, uh, I see both similarities and differences. So it's, it's a wonderful uh, opportunity for an artist, I think, to have a retrospective. And I love this gallery and I love this museum. And, you know, I grew up in Brockton, so, uh, it's a, a very interesting re, uh, return for me. It's, yeah, and I, I should say, um, uh, at the risk of inserting myself into the narrative here, that I was actually an intern at the Fuller Museum when I was, I want to say, 19 years old. <laughs> so there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot That's of wonderful. energy yeah. in, our, in our lives. Um, and it is indeed wonderful to see the show uh, coming to the, beautiful galleries there. Um, we have a few minutes, so I, I think it would be nice to take questions for Marilyn. And I think the easiest way to do that would be if people just put them in the chat and I'll read them out so we don't have any more technical mishaps. Um, <laughs> as people are thinking about what they might want to ask, Beth, do you have any questions you'd want to uh, pose to Marilyn here? Um, I have just a few comments um, that I wanted to just share with everyone. First, Marilyn, I love mm -hmm. to hear what you said about the opera code. And one of my favorite um, moments and working on this show was the moment that you came in and saw Opera Code and it was still horizontal on a one of the dollies that we have and you know watching you go up to it it was like seeing you visit you know a long lost friend and I remember you commenting that you so rarely get to see it up close um, and that you know that was just a special moment for me to see you kind of reunited um, with such you know an emotional, wonderful piece. Um, and then one question that I, I get asked a lot, Marilyn, is um, the decision that you had to take the pieces, their latest series, the Nevertheless She Persisted, the few that have come off the wall. And I know that I, I, I see a lot of really interesting connections between your original inspiration of the ancient sculptures and how those existed in three dimensions. And now here we are almost, your work is almost coming full circle in a way that it's coming off the wall. And I also see kind of some feminist overtones of holding space and taking up space in the room. And I think that's a really beautiful, um, I don't know if that was intended or not, but I, I certainly see that. So um, can you talk a little bit about that decision to bring them off the wall and onto the floor? Uh, yes, I've never thought of myself as a sculptor. I, I really don't think in total three dimensions. So even these that have come off the wall, in a way, they're more relief. Uh, relief is what I've been interested in, in collage and assemblage. Uh, and uh, usually the only three-dimensional objects I had made like were some when I worked over something like a coat or uh, a knapsack. But if you look at these, uh, they just have two sides. And uh, it's, it's sort of a cross between a statue and a dress. And, uh, mm. and I've always really been interested in fashion and clothing as well as, uh, as, as in other kinds of art. And when I first went to art school, I, I thought I was going to major in fashion. But then when I started to work at summer camps uh, with children, I changed my mind and decided I wanted to be a teacher instead. 
And can you talk a little bit about the backs of these pieces? Right, and the, the backs yeah. of these pieces, uh, and, and my assistant Liz does a lot of that. She does most of it. Uh, and uh, the whole idea is that these pieces over time are deteriorating and, mm. and falling apart. I mean, that's sort of a sim my symbol for them aging and falling apart. And uh, I mean, we talk about uh, how that's going to be the, uh, visually, what colors to use and mm. And uh, Liz and I get together once a week, and then she works at home some. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so that is is really uh, the the part uh, that's going forward in time and showing what happens over time. You know, we have a an interesting question in the chat that's uh, sort of exactly on that point, Mary Parker wants to know how have your hands reacted to such intense use after all this time? <laughs> they get sore, but I, <laughs> I'd still be able, uh, able to work. I, I do a lot of exercises with them. And uh, I mean, at one point uh, they got quite sore for quite a long time, but then they seem to get better again. So, mm -hmm. so far so good. I, um, I'm still able to work. Uh, I don't work as many hours as I used to, but uh, but I'm still working with my hands. So, do you think, Marilyn, that you've um, that your craft has changed a lot? Because uh, you know, looking at those early pieces with the uh, what I might call the approximate worksmanship of the stitching um, and the very dense, fine thread work of these pieces, it does seem to me like your skill set has changed a lot. And I wonder how, again, that looks to you now seeing it in the retrospective. Yes, uh, I, I think that happened when I went back to working with uh, fabrics and fibers when I was getting close to retirement from teaching. And I didn't want to just go back to what I was doing before, mm -hmm. but I wanted both the subject matter to be different and somehow uh, I started to work uh, with thread rather than yarn, and I, but with linen, which I had often worked on before, and uh, somehow uh, I began drawing more with the uh, with the thread, and it became more of a kind of an illusionistic sort of of uh, of way of showing these ancient. Greek uh, statues that I was interested in. So I don't know beyond that. I don't remember making a clear decision. Well, I don't want to do this and I'm going to do that. But it, I think it sort of grew. Mm -hmm. Because when I was trying to uh, start to work with these figures, I, I, it, they didn't just happen. I, I spent a couple of years making um, uh, painted figures uh, or paper figures. So um, uh, finally, the stitching came back into it and uh, somehow this just grew. You know, um, th th we have another good question that's very much on that point, and this is from the artist Laura Petrovich Cheney. Hi, Laura. Uh, it's good to see you here. Um, and Laura asks, can you please describe the relationship between working on fabric stitching, collage, and drawings? Do you work each piece independently until its completion, or do you sew for a bit and then draw and then sew again? I'd love to know your process between materials. Great question. Uh, I have in the past done uh, some uh, collages while I'm also stitching. But right now, um, I it just takes me so long to do these pieces that I've, I've spent all of my time uh, just stitching and one at a time because they take so long. But I, I keep thinking I would like to um, start a new set of collages. The last set of collages was inspired by some masks, some old masks that uh, a friend gave me. Thank you, Judy. 
and uh, uh, so I, I, I don't know. Uh, she's given me some more masks. <laughs> I have been thinking of uh, doing that, but I haven't actually started it yet. Great. Um, and I just wanted to put this mask up uh, so people can see that because that's, a, of course, a, another um, consistent. Yes. I think what interested me there was um, that the eyes are not cut out of this mask. So I, I think of them as uh, kind of uh, looking inward at planning a trip. And then the maps mm -hmm. are with all of these lines going every which way. Uh, reminds me of when we used to uh, take these long driving trips in in Europe and uh, uh, would be studying uh, paper maps and uh, planning with them and then actually using them when you're trying to find your way. And uh, I think this is nostalgia for that kind of traveling which we don't do anymore. That's right, exactly. We're, well, we're in the age of Google Maps now. Um, and I'll um, just use that as a slightly weak segue to our last question from the audience, which is about technology and um, the feeling of now. So this is from Nona Hershey, who says, I remember seeing nevertheless, she persisted in your studio, Marilyn, and the surprise when I walked behind the piece to see what felt like static electricity, the relentless buzz of technology and the urgency of now. That is so well put. And she's wondering if um, you also made that association with the idea of digital static and you know technological electrical signals. Uh, well, no, I didn't know no, <laughs> but I'm very interested in hearing it. And uh, well, as you, as you can see, I'm not very technically inclined. And uh, so probably that would not be the first thing that would uh, uh, pop into my head, uh, but I like that idea a lot. <laughs> yeah, I like it too, and it, it really grounds the recent work in right now. And it's, I think, it is interesting to note that you know you were being a sensitive register, as I said, of your times in the late '60s and early '70s, and still apparently doing it now. So that says a lot about your artistic practice. And I think I can say with absolute assurance that we would all rather you do stitching than practice zooming. So we're really glad you were able to <laughs> make it here nonetheless. And um, I think I should hand it back over to Beth just to see us out. Yes, yeah, thank you so much, Glenn. Thank you, Marilyn. I do wanted to say one note, Glenn, is that not only were you an intern here, um, your uh, connection with the museum has persisted over the years. And in fact, Glenn was the lead, wrote the lead essay for Marilyn's retrospective catalog and a brilliant essay at that. So um, thank you for your continued support of this exhibition and participating and for leading this discussion. Thank you, Marilyn, for being here, um, for sharing your work with all of us and for sharing your insights and your talent and it's really been a true honor to be working with you the show closes everyone on sunday please come for the closing reception on saturday um, and thank you all for being here really appreciate it thank you to the sponsors and and all the audience so thank you everyone thank you so much marilyn great to see you yes Thanks, everyone. thank you for hanging in there with me by the way <laughs> you're welcome <laughs> bye bye everyone <laughs>